I am Kenny Coogan, the Education Director for the International Carnivorous Plant Society. And I'm really excited to have uh, Dr. Phil Sheridan here. He's a superstar. He's gonna be talking about the preservation that he works on. And then after that, I'm gonna briefly talk about ICPS. And during that time, you guys can type questions in the bottom uh, chat box, and then I will direct them to him. Thank you, Kenny. It's great to uh, have you all here after New Year's. And uh, so I'm gonna be talking about the work of MetaView uh, preventing rare plant extinction in the Mid-Atlantic. So my goals and comments in this talk, I wanna give you an overview of the mission, methods, and achievements of MetaView. With over a 25 year history, I can't cover everything we've done. So uh, please ask questions at the end of the talk if you uh, don't understand something or miss something or have any questions. And the talk is largely focused on efforts in Virginia because of political hurdles to conservation in Maryland. However, we have made had accomplishments in Maryland and they're worth bringing up. So for example, we've prevented the extinction of the box huckleberry uh, in collaboration with the USDA and Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Uh, that's Galacea brachycera. It was only known from one site in Maryland. Nothing was being done to prevent its extinction. It went down to a couple plants. We intervened and got the, the feds involved and prevented its extinction. We led research and recovery efforts of rare Western shore Atlantic white cedar populations. Atlantic white cedar is important for uh, pitcher plant habitat. Uh, we rediscovered New Jersey rush in Charles County, Maryland. It was considered extirpated from Maryland with other rare associates, including purple pitcher plants, on a globally rare gravel bog. That's uh, the only remaining purple pitcher plant site now on the western shore of Maryland and it's protected. Um, we discovered purple pitcher plant, uh, rediscovered it on the Magothy River, Maryland, and we discovered pink sundew in Southern Maryland. So we've got a number of achievements in Maryland, but we're gonna focus on Virginia. And let's look at the mission of MetaView. A lot of people really don't know what the mission of MetaView is. So let's state it clearly. It's to preserve and restore pitcher plant wetlands and their associated ecosystems in Maryland and Virginia through a unique five-step process of discovery, propagation, research, reintroduction, and education. Further, uh, we want to establish a series of nature preserves to protect pitcher plant resources in perpetuity. And so another thing that people can't see is how does MetaView run? Well, we have a board of uh, five board members. Uh, we, we are very involved as board members in the operations of the organization, but we also have, uh, we have had in the past paid or part-time staff, and we have had and have had volunteers. Our corporate headquarters is located in Central Virginia at Meadowview, that's the name of the headquarters in Woodford. We have a plant nursery right at the headquarters. So that's all good, but then yeah, how do you run an organization? Where does the cash come from? And so that was a big question in the beginning because there's no book on how to do this. And so this is, has been an evolving um, effort in, and a successful effort at that in nonprofit conservation work in a, in a niche market and how do you do it? And there's a significant element of faith in this, I have to tell you, but a lot of hard work, a lot of grit and determination, but we identified that our, our plants, our pitcher plants were actually a commodity that we could sell in a niche market and generate cash for operations. And that is supplemented by uh, state, federal and foundation grants. In many cases, those are matching grants. So they, 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 they put a leverage on us, they strain us to get the job done, but they're important. We have over 300 members worldwide that donate and put money in. So the cash comes in that way. And then we have over here, we have our preserve system that developed over time. And we'll talk about it later in the talk. So we've got our Joseph Pines Preserve in Southern Virginia with Center for Biodiversity. And as that preserve has grown, we a new timber uh, uh, source of revenue has been identified in, in timber. Uh, as we convert to longleaf pine restoration, we've been able to realize revenue from timber harvest, and that goes back into the organization. 
running the organization. Then we have our Central Virginia Preserve. So we have our two preserves, Joseph Pond and Central Virginia Preserve. So there's a kind of a overview of how the organization works. We have contractors and professional staff as well, uh, attorneys, accountants. We've had prescribed burn managers help us as well and other contractors. Uh, we work very hard, but uh, we have to have additional help and sometimes getting professionals is the way to go. So that's a, just an overview. If you ever want to do a nonprofit, uh, have a flow chart and try to sketch out how you're going to do it. You'll change it, but at least there's our blueprint uh, for how it can be done. Another question I frequently get, well, gee, Phil, I know you like pitcher plants, but why are they important? Who cares? Well, I care. And a lot of other people care. A lot of our viewing audience cares. But let's look at the reasons, because we have to justify why we do the work. So first of all, they're beautiful. Pitcher plants are beautiful. Beauty has value. So that makes them important. They also have ecological function. They bring limiting nutrients into their environment from carnivory. And this has frankly been an attribute that has been missed or ignored in its significance. So if you accept that uh, carnivorous habitats, the dogma is carnivorous plant habitats are nutrient limited habitats. And so pitcher plants buy, buy carnivory and it's kilograms of nutrients they're bringing in are bringing in limiting nutrients into a nutrient limited ecosystem. That's important very important and it can be quantified they're valuable commercial plants well there we go now we got a dollar value people like that there's there's economic value in pitcher plants as a commercial quantity back to ecology they're early bloomers and nourish the first pollinators in bogs in many cases they are state listed uh, rare threatened or endangered species they're also a model organisms for study of complex ecosystems national science foundation is provided ongoing funding to researchers to uh, develop a model for ecosystem study using the purple pitcher plants. Pitcher plants are part of zero order stream systems where water first emerges from the ground. So protection of that habitat of which pitcher plants are a part maintains high water quality. And finally, the cautionary principle, we shouldn't lose our biota. This was just on 60 Minutes this weekend. Uh, Paul Ehrlich and other biologists are, are telling us, uh, we're seeing it, you're going to see it in this talk, we're, we're on the sixth mass extinction, it's happening on our watch. We're losing our inheritance, our, our biological inheritance, so we shouldn't do that. So all those reasons are why pitcher plants are important. So in Virginia, we have two native species. We have the yellow pitcher plant and the purple pitcher plant. And they occur in a variety of uh, ecosystems. Uh, whoops, I'm trying to get this screen off the top here. This bar, bear with me one second. I better not touch that. So we've got pond pine picosans, Atlantic white cedar swamps, which I mentioned earlier to you, seepage bogs, and longleaf pine flatwoods are all the communities that pitcher plants are found in Virginia and, and Maryland to a certain extent. Now let's look at the range, the historic range of uh, yellow pitcher plant. It extends from southeastern Virginia all the way to uh, far eastern Alabama. So we're at the very northern limit of yellow pitcher plant. That's important. So we're in this mid-Atlantic transition zone with two species of pitcher plants at the reaches of their range. And so this is a critical area to do conservation work. And if you look at the exploded map, so we had something like 21 historic sites for yellow pitcher plant. We're now, there were, we were down to six, we're now down to one. That's not gonna be protected. The state will not intervene. Got the email from them. They're not gonna do anything. And on my watch, those other sites have been lost. The, the sites have been lost, not the plants, because we got backup. So we, we've got a crisis that uh, we've got beautiful, important pitcher plants that, that were being lost and nobody was doing anything. And here's an example. Here's a site, a historic site. This was found by Fernald back in the 1930s in Prince George County, just south of Petersburg. We found a herbarium specimen, tracked the site down, 
landowners told us, yeah, they used to be up in a corner of the field. You can go up there. And we found them. They were still there. And we, we tracked the population to extinction. This is a historic site where they were naturally found, but over decades of agricultural pastoral use, a, a valley that was full of pitcher plants. They actually told us this. This place was full of them, full of yellow pitcher plants. We tracked it to extinction. Now, we did get division, so we didn't lose the material, but it, it kind of exemplifies what's happened, and we'll see additional data in the talk, what's happened and is still happening range-wide. It's not in Virginia. This is range-wide is happening, what is happening to pitcher plant populations. If you do nothing, you're going to lose them. And they're not in the seed bank. It's permanent loss. So I did my PhD on uh, purple pitcher plant in Maryland and Virginia. And uh, this is the map of purple pitcher plant, Maryland, Virginia, and DC. We had 42 historic sites in Virginia and 13 in Maryland and DC. And by 2010, when I completed my PhD, we only had 14 sites uh, left in Virginia and four in Maryland, on the western shore of Maryland. And our, so basically about a third of the original sites were left. And that's the regional picture. And if you look at individual sites, this was again during the PhD I did this, I actually had a moving target. I was watching sites extirpate during the PhD. And there it is, there's the curves. And then you could go regionally and predict total extirpation in Maryland and Virginia. We're, we're right on track actually, uh, actually exceeding this. So we, we were actually able to predict uh, total extirpation of pitcher plants in Maryland and Virginia. We're, we're exceeding expectations. A disturbing thought, by the way, but on a global scale, this is frankly nothing new. It reflects a global problem. We have a local issue that's a global issue. So uh, the causes of purple pitcher plant extinction in Maryland during my PhD was succession was simply the sites being invaded by hardwoods and being shaded out. Uh, there's a lot of other attributes of succession. There's shade, there's infection from fungus, there's lowered water tables. There's a, it's a complex process. It's an extremely powerful force against pitcher plants. Essentially within 20 years, you can have a healthy pitcher plant bog and have nothing left, no pitcher plants. In 20 years, complete extirpation without intervention. That's a, it's an amazingly fast phenomenon. But in addition to that, we had beaver flooding wiping out 33% of the sites. Um, beaver are ecological engineers and actually could benefit pitcher plants. But when you're down to small populations with a few plants, they're very susceptible to the large impacts of beaver and they're not able to recover. Uh, development had a uh, small impact, and in one case, removed the plants prior to development. So, uh, remember, we talked about uh, associated ecosystems, working on associated ecosystems as part of our mission. You can't preserve pitcher plants without taking, or other any other organism for that matter, without taking an ecosystem approach. It's really the correct approach to any organism because organisms occur in an ecosystem. So you have to scale up, look at it as an ecosystem and come at it from that standpoint to preserve your species of interest. And of course, hopefully much more than that. So uh, we've spent a lot of time on research and discovery and reintroduction efforts with longleaf pine. And there's a reason, uh, here's a, map of the range of longleaf pine and it closely matches the range of the genus Saracenia. There's a very big reason. Uh, longleaf pine, and I'm so interested in longleaf pine because of this, is a fire adapted species and it brings fire into the pitcher plant community. And it's different from loblolly or other pines because longleaf pine lives for hundreds of years, four or 500 years. It's uh, it's more resistant to the impacts of fire. It's uniquely adapted to fire. 
And so it really facilitates restoration efforts for the pitcher plant community. And so we started from the very top and said, we better work with Longleaf Pine if we're gonna preserve pitcher plants in Southeastern Virginia. And, uh, and it's been time well spent. Uh, so here's a map of, of Longleaf Pine in Virginia, very similar to yellow pitcher plants and similar losses to pitcher plants. Uh, we did the census of Longleaf Pine in Virginia back in 1998, and there were less than 2,000 native Longleaf Pine left on less than 400 acres out of an original estimated 1.5 million acres. Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's ecosystem collapse. But that's, in fact, what's happened. So you can see how pitcher plants and, and their ecosystem and Longleaf Pine are related. And the work has to be done on both fronts. And what's interesting too, we 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 thought this, and it uh, we found evidence for it that uh, longleaf pine or, or Virginia genotype was better adapted, was had greater fitness for uh, restoration in Virginia. And this was uh, this finding was repeated by the Department of Forestry, and it led to a, a statewide effort to preserve the indigenous Virginia longleaf pine genotype. Or restoration effort. And that's uh, that's a, was it because of Medivy's work. And frankly, there's a moral reason. I mean, these trees were left in our state just like our pitcher plants. Why bring something else in from out of state when these are the organisms that are here, which have worked with that? But it was nice to have it also uh, supported by science that indeed the indigenous genotype was the best adapted genotype for restoration in Virginia. So we came up with a five-step process to, to do our, our work, and that is discovery, propagation, research, reintroduction, and education. So discovery means to go out and look for new populations of these rare plants or to discover or rediscover old populations that are on herbarium sheets to see if they're still in existence. And so we've done a lot of field work, original field work, looking for populations of rare plants. So this slide is an example of Shans Bog in Dinwiddie County. 12 state rare plant species were found there. I found this back in the 1980s and reached out to the Nature Conservancy to try to get it protected. They wouldn't do anything. And they said, well, see, Bill, the problem is pitcher plants are more common elsewhere. Well, guess what? No, they're not. And that site's been lost. Uh, the pitcher plants haven't, and some of the other associates we got division. But you know, we, we can't let we can't lose these sites anymore. There isn't enough left to lose, and um, it, it's very difficult because when you look at all the species that are in peril, it's a very competitive environment, and uh, there are many, many, many organisms that need protection, and it's just more work than any one organization can do, and. Of course, that's why Metaviews here is to, to work on this community to, to pry, try to prevent its, its extirpation. But anyway, that's discovery. Then uh, where warranted, and it certainly was with the yellow pitcher plant, we'll get propagules and bring them into the propagation phase at Metaview. Here's our national pitcher plant collection at Metaview. And then again, where warranted, we'll do research on the organism. So, We've done a lot of work on, uh, on longleaf pine and uh, Saracenia across the board. There are a number of peer-reviewed, uh, high-value publications looking at the genetics, the biochemistry, the ecology of these organisms. Because with research, we get insights and we learn and we learn about the organism. And that knowledge then is going to play a critical role in uh, reintroduction and restoration efforts. This picture right here is an example of um, some research we did on rooting longleaf pine needle fascicles. You can actually, at a young age, you can uh, take longleaf pine needle fascicles and root them and actually regenerate them that way. Pretty neat. And we uh, just had a paper last year in Hort Science where we looked at the role of color in insect captures and pitcher plants. And because of the other work we've done on the genetics and the biochemistry and the knowledge we had about the pigments involved, it turns out that red color has no impact on insect captures and pitcher plants. 
this is one of the things that people would accept it as a dogma and it's wrong. And uh, you've got to watch that in science, bias. We're attracted to red color as humans. We like red color, but actually it, the color does not play a role in insect captures. Anyway, that got published in Hort Science, part of our research. Reintroduction, now this is a big deal. And so let's, uh, let's look at how we define, and this is actually our definition working with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. So reintroduction is to establish a plant taxon that was recently lost from part of its historic range or that enhances populations which remain within the historic range. And further, we defined what is historic range. So it's suitable habitat within the physiogeographic range of the taxa since the 1600s, but the organism may not necessarily have been documented from the specific site. So in, in many cases, some biologists say, well, you can't put an organism back unless you can prove it occurred in that exact site. And you know that, that is just too strict. It's unrealistic. And so this acknowledges that. And we use this, so this is our method of doing reintroduction. And you'll see there's reasons why we've, we've defined it this way. There are very good reasons. So reintroduction is not gardening. You'll hear people say, oh, reintroduction is gardening. No, it's not. Look up the definition of gardening. Gardening is growing a plant in a, a common garden near a house. That's not what we're doing. Okay, so that's a disparaging comment. I don't want to hear it. Reintroduction is not garden. Reintroduction is not Johnny Appleseed. We're not, I don't want to hear that either. We're not just spreading seeds willy nilly like a bunch of idiots. That's not what reintroduction is. And then occasionally I get this when I take people to our preserves and tell them these are the indigenous plants that we rescued, we prevented extinction, and we put them on our preserve. And they go, but you planted it there, right? Yes, absolutely. Get over it. I mean, so what? I mean, when pitcher plants can only last 20 years as a site succeeds and are wiped out, it, it's totally ridiculous to say, oh, Phil, you've got a property that was uh, succeeded for 100 years and there's no pitcher plants and now you've planted them there. And that's, that's, not, that's no good. They don't know what they're talking about. The plants have died out. These are widespread common plants They've been shaded out and lost. You have to reintroduce them. Many cases of where this is needed. And I've personally seen in my life during the PhD, I literally saw populations go extinct on my watch. Going back to these sites, I saw over time the process actually happen and species disappear from habitat. So reintroduction is required to restore diversity and prevent extinction. Now, let's bring up longleaf pine again. So there's been some interesting uh, situations here in Virginia where our heritage program and TNC have, uh, have been reintroducing or, or planting longleaf pine. One of them was the Chubb Sandhill Natural Area. And I'm like, I don't remember reading where longleaf pine was native to Chubb Sandhill. I went back in the literature. No, no, absolutely no record of longleaf pine ever occurring at Chubb Sandhill. And yet they're planning long life at Chubb Sandhill. So I reached out to Rick Myers at the Heritage Program and said, Rick, I said, you know, do you have any evidence of long life at Chubb Sandhill? He goes, well, no, we don't have any direct records. He goes, but long life pine is the singular exception and because of its ecosystem properties and we can introduce that. What? But yet you can't introduce pitcher plants. Now that's called hypocrisy. I mean, really, let's call it what it is. So I find it very interesting that uh, that's actually totally valid in our methodology to plant longleaf pine at Chubb Sandhill. It's in the physiogeographic range. It's in the right habitat. That's exactly the methodology of Meadowview being used by our state heritage program. Good job, guys. I'm glad you're doing what we said you should do. You just need to broaden it to other imperiled species. And so what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I mean, uh, this is falling right into my lap and I'm, I'm going to just tout, tout our horn on this. Why not? So. It's kind of funny. So uh, here's some examples of reintroduction. So again, our, our, our goals have remained the same, but our methods have had to improve and change over time based on the situation. So 
originally we didn't have any uh, property that we owned. Uh, we had the idea, uh, the mission, we didn't have property. So uh, I saw these uh, failed wetland mitigation sites, they called them acidic hotspots. That's great. We like acidic hotspots with sphagnum moss and lycopodiums. They considered them failed because they couldn't get weedy, woody species growing. I'm like, this is perfect. You've got open soil with sphagnum and lycopodium. So can we plant pitcher plants there? And they said, yes. So we had a couple of VDOT wetland mitigation sites. We did very successful uh, pitcher plant planting. This was um, uh, down in Greensville County. And then here's another site up in Prince George County. And uh, these flourished for a number of years. And then we did some other out plantings with landowners. But ultimately, over time, uh, this doesn't work. Because here's why. So the, the VDOT, wetland mitigation, wet, wet, VDOT wetland mitigation sites ultimately succeeded. And we, we attempted to check it and cut stuff back. But it's a lot of work. And we don't own the property. And, um, and then in other cases, working with private landowners, they either took care of them or gave the plants away or power lines got sprayed. And the short story is, unless you own the property, like we do now with our preserves, you're wasting your time. Okay, unless you have a conservation easement on it with strict protocols. It, it, this is the bottom line. It's a great idea that doesn't work. And you have to just accept that and move on. And we did. And we said, well, we, we do have a concept of having our own preserves. And we ultimately, we started down that road and got our own land. And, and our total focus now is on our property. I still get people, why don't you come over and plant pitcher plants on my land? No, nope, no, thank you. I'm not wasting my time. I don't have time to waste. I'm 62. I'm running out of time. <laughs> I know, you know, there's physical mortality. So I have to look at that now. There's no time to waste. Anyway, so anyone else wants to copy our methods elsewhere, listen and learn. Get your own land. Don't waste your time. And then education. Uh, working with school groups anywhere from elementary school students to college students as seniors, as, uh, as interns. Uh, education is very important. Outreach and talks like this, uh, that's, that's the fifth step in our five-step process. And it's been a very, I think, a very effective methodology. So discovery, propagation, research, reintroduction, and education, the MetaView five-step process. So now let's look at our preserve system. So we, we have two preserves. We've got Joseph Pines in Sussex County, the Central Virginia Preserve in Caroline County. Uh, Joseph Pines, the goal is 2,000 plus contiguous acres. Uh, Central Virginia, 150 plus contiguous acres. Right now, Joseph Pines, we're at 428 acres. Central Virginia Preserve, we're at 78. The uh, Joseph Pines is a longly fine ecosystem. Uh, the Central Virginia Preserve is a globally rare gravel bog. So they're, they're different systems. And so they've got different management. Okay. It takes money. This, this is not coming out of thin air. Let's talk the costs. So to date, we've spent uh, almost a million dollars at Joseph Pines and just shy of 600000 on the Central Virginia Preserve. So pitcher plant conservation costs millions of dollars. That's right, I'll say it again, millions of dollars and decades or lifetimes of work. I've spent my life on this. I started out as a kid interested in this, developed it ultimately into a nonprofit. I'm gonna spend the rest of my life doing it. And, and that's one life. So millions of dollars and lifetimes of work and that should be sobering to any of you listening. And this is mission work for dedicated people. This isn't just I work nine to five, Monday through Friday. I work every day. I show something every day. I love what I'm doing. Uh, and that's what it takes to get the job done here. Millions of dollars, mission work with dedicated people. So here's our Center for Biodiversity in Southern Virginia. So we've got that large preserve, Joseph Pines in Sussex County. And we've been three men in a, in a camper out on the center of the preserve. That was great for a while. 
But ultimately, it got to the point where we realized we needed actually a building down there uh, to, to do the work we're doing. So we, it, that's worked out great. So we've got a nice structure down there for volunteers and visitors with grow out beds uh, for restoration on that preserve. Uh, and that really helps doing the work at Joseph Pond. And it's an educational center. We're working on getting the second floor uh, completed for talks and training. We've already we've had interns there for a number of years. And our goals at the Center for Biodiversity is to have an education center, a rare plant nursery for on-site and regional restoration, and facilities for staff and visitors. Our reintroduction goals at Joseph Pines are to prevent loss of plant source material in unprotected site. So think back to what I was talking about earlier in the talk about these sites we found that weren't protected, that in fact now have been lost. So we've got that material in most cases and have prevented loss of that genetic material from Virginia. And that's gonna allow us to provide plant genotypes for future lo local restoration efforts for whenever society or heritage program decides that rare plants can be planted out in the wild. I don't know if they'll ever get up to speed on that, but we'll have them and we're gonna have them on our preserve and they won't be extinct. And we're gonna reestablish the biodiversity of this historic community in Virginia with our indigenous genotypes. So here's our grand preserve plan for Joseph Pines. So right now, Joseph Pines is site number one. We're up to 428 acres. Number two is our Center for Biodiversity. And amazingly, over Christmas, we got several incredible Christmas gifts. One of our members, Mark Lysney, that passed in November, uh, left us an estate of $181,000. Thank you, Mark. And uh, we, we bought the game light track, that's the, the lower number one here in 2020. And we have a large note payment on that. And uh, with Mark's donation, we'll put that on principal and we have $30,000 left to pay that off. So one of our large recent acquisitions, uh, within the next year, we should be able to pay off. And then we take our, hopefully our next big leap, which is right here, the John Hancock Life Insurance Policy, a uh, John Hancock Life Insurance Company, uh, of 494 acres, site number three. That's next on the chopping block. And uh, I hope I, I hope we can pull that off. Um, you know, we'll be able to uh, put in for state matching grants. That's going to be a million plus uh, dollar acquisition. Uh, but ultimately, we hope to get this all of these lands here. That's our 2,000 acre preserve. And one day, we'll link up with Cherry Orchard Bog over here. This is a site that my friend Bill Shaw and I found back in the 1980s, it had two purple pitcher plants and the state, the state ended up acquiring it for tiny bog buttons. And um, hopefully one day we'll link up to that and we'll have a corridor going over there. So, uh, so pitcher plants are right here, not far from Joseph Pine. So you can see they were here, they were over here, they were all through this area. Anyway, that's a grand preserve plan for Joseph Pine. Now, to give you an idea of what succession looks like in southeastern Virginia, Joseph Pines uh, had about a hundred year old forest on it of hardwoods. It was cut by an investment company in the 1990s, and the original land holding of 400 acres was chopped up, and the Whiteheads got it. And this is what it looked like just a few years. This is one of the bogs, just like three years after logging. And it's already, you can see sphagnum here. This is an off season view, but it's thick shrubbery. Just a three years after logging, it's this thick. That's not good for, that's very intense competition, but there's ways to deal with it. So the uh, DR field uh, and brush mower walk behind bush hog. It's a little harder to use this as you get older, okay? When you're 30 or 40, that's not bad. At 60, you can do it, but it's starting to get a little, little rough, that's, but the young, done guys and gals on that, but it's a very useful tool for bog restoration and edges, and we, we still use it. Tractors and bush hog, very effective. We studied power line rights away maintained by bush hogging. It's a very effective method to keep bogs and bog edges open, and we, we use it for that purpose. Uh, we do use uh, chemical sprays, uh, either by contract crew or in-house. I, I don't particularly like using it, but it's an accepted method in lawley pine restoration, and uh, it's useful. 
uh, in the right hands. It can be very damaging in the wrong hands, but in the right hands, it can be a very effective method to control competition. And then we get some of the advanced toys. Uh, there's the uh, bull hog that you put on a skid steer mulch, uh, and you do this, you can just take down a, uh, an area that you want to convert to long leaf and pitcher plants and mow it down and burn it. Fire is uh, the most effective, efficient way to restore a habitat. But we use all both me mechanical, chemical, and fire. We use all three depending on the conditions. And here's one of our longleaf meadows going up in flames. So we burn, we try to burn every year. And, and for Joseph Pines, for the sandy loams we're on, annual fire is what's needed to keep control of the site, keep the, ha keep the pitcher plant bogs habit open, and we've got beautiful results. And there it is. So that Gary's Church site that I mentioned to you, we tracked to extinction where we got divisions. Those are the plants from Gary's Church on Joseph Pine. Isn't that beautiful? And that's what it would have looked like. This is a, a true restoration. This is if you could have gone back to Virginia in the 1930s with M.L. Fernald and Bayard Long tooling along the dirt roads. He, he, he actually said this. He said, we're S. Flava, recognizable from a distance. Wow. I've seen that down south, but not in Virginia. But he was able to see that. And you can now see that at Joseph Pines. This is what our preserve looks like. And it doesn't exist anywhere else in Virginia uh, in, in, on any protected property. And in fact, uh, Steve Gallick that came out back in March, you know, this was our goal. And he and I had another a person say the same thing. They said, Phil, this is the best pitcher plant bog I've seen north of South Carolina. And that was our goal, to have the best pitcher plant habitat in a multi-state area. And we're there now. Here again, Longleaf Pine. Longleaf pine and pitcher plants. This is the grass stage seedling of longleaf pine. And this is the blue stem longleaf pine savanna that we now have at Joseph Pines that we burn. It's great habitat for bobwhite quail, which is another imperiled species in Virginia because there's very little burning. And so you've got to burn to keep this habitat open for rare birds like bobwhite quail, Bachman sparrow, et cetera, red cockaded woodpeckers. And it's beautiful. It actually, it kills the ticks. Here's another benefit. By annual burning, you reduce your tick load. We can walk around at Joseph Pines in shorts and there's, we're, we don't have ticks because they're burned up, killed wholesale. So there's hygiene as well by burning. And our Virginia trees, uh, one of the uh, Virginia longleaf pine trees, a new attribute that we identified with our Virginia provenance, Virginia genotype, the Virginia longleaf pine genotype reach, reaches reproductive maturity sooner than other Southern longleaf. How about that? And we're already producing our own seed from our own trees now that we planted, that we gathered from the wild. Pretty amazing stuff. And we have had some plants come up from the seed bank. So while I say pitcher plants aren't going to be in the seed bank, you know, this is complex. Other plants can be. For example, uh, the dwarf sundew, Drosera brevifolia. Uh, we didn't have it there prior to any of the clearing or opening, but in some of our scraped fire breaks, uh, this plant came up from the seed bank. We've had uh, the Sandhills fire lily, Asclepius rubra, and Luwigia hertella. And a number of other rare plants have reappeared on the preserve. So where do we stand now? So species richness in Joseph Pines bog plots, 33. And we've increased species richness by 50% by increasing, by introducing our rare plant taxa. And out of my PhD, historical species richness was as high as 319 species in Virginia pitcher plant bogs. But when I did my PhD, species richness ranged from 11 to 83 species per site in remaining uh, natural purple pitcher plant sites. So essentially, we've been defoliated. We've lost diversity. And you can compare that with species richness in southeastern bogs, 22 to 277. But, but our thesis still, still stands. 
that we have lost diversity in our pitcher plant blogs in Virginia, and that the diversity it needs to be brought back, and that requires reintroduction. And other than Atlanta Botanic Garden, who's, who's got a very similar program, there aren't a lot of organizations doing aggressive reintroduction like this. Uh, here's a table of, of the a number of the reintroduced plants at Joseph Pines. There's a personality to these plants. Uh, some are re easier to reintroduce than others. Some we haven't been able to reintroduce. We've, we've put, put them in, for example, Utricularia juncea. Several times we've brought a local genotype from just down the road. We can't get it to take. So its ecology is more complex. It's going to take more work. And it's rare for a reason. So that tells you something too. So it's interesting to see the different personalities, the different ecology of the different plants uh, and how they behave on reintroduction. Now, let's ponder this. So back to longleaf pine. There was no native longleaf pine left in Sussex County where Joseph Pines is located in my whole lifetime, actually. I think they're actually take it back in the 1970s, a few were recorded in the southern part of Sussex County and they were logged out, just a few trees. But certainly no longleaf pine at Joseph Pines. But when we got Joseph Pines, we started a restoration effort. We said we're certainly going to plant longleaf pine here from using native Virginia genotype. Well, on one of the fire breaks, a piece of uh, what we call light wood of resin soaked heart pine was unearthed on one of the fire breaks. And we'd already done a lot of research on, on light wood to, to identify longleaf pine. So we were prepared for this. And so I said, I wonder if that piece of light wood is longleaf pine. So I cut it open. And there are two measurements you can measure in the center of the tree, the diameter of the pith and the second annual ring. And in fact, this, this piece of light wood came out as a solid uh, piece of longleaf pine. We were able to positively identify it as longleaf pine. So imagine that the keystone tree, tree was at Joseph Pines. It was just wiped out, buried in the bog. No pitcher plants were at Joseph Pines, no longleaf were at Joseph Pines, but the keystone tree was there buried in the mire. But wait, how long had it been there? Well, we sent the sample off for radiocarbon analysis. And the, we got several dates, but the most likely date was about 1650. Wow, this, this is really an incredible story. And six, 1650 is about the time the first wave of English colonists were coming into Sussex County. And of course, Longleaf was, 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 a, was, was attacked pretty brutally by the early colonists. There's a number of papers on the whole story there. So we had Longleaf Pine at Joseph Pine at settlement. And it was wiped down. And furthermore, we had Native Americans living on Joseph Pine. There's more to the story, more than I can get into here, but the Chero and Haka uh, Indians or not away Indians uh, actually had a settlement at Joseph Pines. We've got uh, pottery fragments. So we had Native Americans there with longleaf pine with frequent burning. You can see how this whole thing worked with beautiful meadows of pitcher plants. And then we look at the hydrology. We had a, gra had a graduate student work on the hydrology at Joseph Pines because as we started clearing the site, it looked like the bogs were getting wetter. And in fact, we we're right. Uh, so here's a cross section of the stratigraphy of Joseph Pines, and the short story is, is if you uh, convert a dense hardwood pine forest to a low density longleaf pine savanna, you raise the water table, and in fact, you reduce evapotranspiration by 25 percent. So on our our test watershed, where our graduate student worked, it was a 25 acre watershed. That's almost 4 million gallons of water in a year staying in the ground. Now, that's significant. That really drives home the point of how insidious succession is. These are shallow groundwater fed aquifers. And so what not, when your pitcher plant bogs get invaded by, by hardwoods and pines, not only do they shade the plants out, they lower the water table. Now, if you're a hydrophyte of pitcher plants that requires water, you're, you're dead 
and you are, I mean, you're dried up and dead. You're shaded out, you're dried up, you're fungally infected, you're gone. So you have to convert this. You have to be aggressive in your management to control competition. And this is reflected now in some other recent studies as well that have, have also found this. Here's something neat too. So in our Addison bog, one of our monitoring wells that's only two foot into the bog, there's me holding a, 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 a vial of water from the bog and I drank it and I sent it off for analysis. No coliform bacteria, potable water. Healthy pitcher plants mean healthy water. You don't have pitcher plants in polluted sites by nature. They're bio, they really are biological indicators. Uh, pitcher plants occur at a, in a fairly narrow niche and you can pollute that site and you can lose them forever. So, but where you find them naturally, it's a testament to high water quality. Now here's our central Virginia preserve, quite a different animal than Southern Virginia, a lot of smaller parcels. Uh, so MetaView is located right here on route two. It's this little red sliver. Uh, we have two parcels under easement, the Sheridan track and the Wilson track. I will point out, we're right now having a GoFundMe effort to pay off the note on the Wilson track. Uh, we had about $38,000 left on the note. We're now down, we had a really great, great summer here. I think we're down to about $25,000 on the note now, thanks to a number of generous donors. And it's ongoing. So we're hoping to pay the Wilson note off in uh, 2023. So thank you to all our donors, by the way. So the Wilson tract and the Sheridan tract are under easement. And right now we're in the middle of, uh, we've, got, we've got three grant awards that we've now received. So we've got all the money, the matching funds we're gonna need to acquire the Mary Lacka tract, the Andalacka tract, the Dunkel tract. We bought the Moon tract uh, in 2021 with a bank loan, but that will also fall under the easement. So all these parcels in blue within the next year should be added to our existing easement as part of our conservation effort. So we're almost, we're getting there. We're really getting there. The native pitcher plants are found here on the hall track. And here's a picture of Dr. Wilson sitting with them. We had 12 plants originally, went to, down to eight, held there for a while and started to crash. We intervened and cleared the site out, got them to bloom, raised them from seed. And we've now planted those plants right here on the Wilson track. Here again, this is reintroduction. They're still on the hall track. It's unprotected. You know, the guy's living there. He doesn't want to sell. There's nothing we can do about it. But what we can do is raise those from seed, which we've done, open the Wilson tract up and plant them there. Now, uh, the Central Virginia Preserve is a globally rare gravel bog. Now, it may seem an oxymoron that you'd have a bog on gravel. Doesn't water go through gravel? Yes, it does. But it goes through the gravel and hits an impermeable clay layer and it seeps out from that through the gravels and you get this very poor gravel and sand with water flowing out and that's how you get a gravel bog. So, so right behind MetaView, we've got the northernmost, and this is what's really so cool. This is the northernmost native, where God put them, the northernmost native purple pitcher plant population in Virginia. We've got state threatened species, the New Jersey rush, and it's right there next to MetaView for high quality management. Uh, I want to point out too, do you see these, these, these gravels, these rounded gravels? This is beachfront property. This is from the Pliocene era from three to five million years ago when uh, the seas were right there at Meadowview. This was beachfront property. It might be in another hundred years at the rate we're going. <laughs> so stay tuned. So here's an example of the reintroduced pitcher plants on the Wilson track. Here's the spring water flowing through there. We've got sphagnum coming up from clearing operations. And out of the seed bank, I predicted this, and in fact, it happened. Uh, the, the state threatened New Jersey rush popped up uh, on the Wilson track. We've got, I think, about half a dozen clumps of New Jersey rush. Pretty cool. We've got trails going back through the Central Virginia Preserve, and uh, we're gonna expand these trails as we get the additional properties. Now, sustainability. Uh, Kenny mentioned that, um, he, I think, has a degree in sustainability, and it's my duty 
to mention this because we practice what we preach. So if we're going to do conservation uh, of natural areas, we also have to, I, I believe this anyway, live the life too as much as we can. And so on a corporate level, what Metaview's done, we've put in a uh, outside wood furnace. We use wood that we get from the landfill down the road or more and more from our own preserve. Um, that heats our greenhouse and facilities. We've got solar thermal panels that we've ingeniously tied into the wood furnace to provide domestic hot water in the summer. We still have propane as a backup, which we very rarely use, but we're, we're basically using a biofuel, which is a sustainable fuel. And that we should be doing more of that. And in Southern Virginia, thanks to one of our members, Conrad Cutter, he's in the solar field and a lot of sweat equity. So we, we really do a lot of sweat equity. We, we built this whole frame here. Conrad came out, he donated panels, and we bought some panels. But our Sussex Center is a producer of electricity. So we're intertied, but we've got like, I think, 7,000 kilowatts now of credits. And that's not hard to do. If we all do it, we'll all make an impact, right? And it's more and more affordable. So, you know, just do it, right? And uh, sustainability in many of you with the interns, we try to teach them. This is not easy, <laughs> but um, composting of organic waste, vegetable gardening, this is a no brainer, right? Really, I mean, just take some time, get your garden in, put up your crops, do it, just do it. It's healthy, it's cheaper. What's not to like? Rainwater capture. So at Metaview, we've got a pond. That's not a problem. We've got a protected watershed up there. Water's not an issue. In Sussex, for our Center for Biodiversity, we, we don't have that. And so we've done rooftop rainwater capture with cisterns. So we've got almost 5,000 gallons in cisterns uh, feeding our plant beds down there. It's a good use of rainwater. So what can you do? Well, you can get a MetaView membership and, and help us. Uh, you can volunteer or you can take an eco vacation and come out, stay with us a week and help out. Uh, donate, donate, donate. I can't say it enough, but please do. Um, you know, as uncomfortable to talk about as it is, it, I have to and I should. Think of us at, at end of life. I mean, your bequests and wills. Look what Mark did. He thought of us. That's an incredible gift. I've written my will. Everything I've got is going to Medivue. Okay, so I've, I've again, I, I've done it. You know, I've, everything I've got is going to go to Medivue. If you can, you know, just think of us. Uh, you could become a Medivue officer. So we've got a vice president position open, secretary. Uh, we, we just uh, aren't getting applicants, qualified applicants. And may Bog Jesus bless you. <laughs> so uh, no, no, no disrespect there. I'm actually quite religious. But uh, Corey out on the West Coast has come up with the legend of Bog Jesus. And it's, I, I find it entertaining and funny. So he's, he's got a sense of humor and so do I. So <laughs> happy New Year. So what questions do you have? OK, thank you so much, Phil. That was great. We have a couple of questions, but first, well, first off, it, thank you for all the ICPS members who are attending this live. In the bottom, there's a chat uh, function and you can type in your questions and I'm going to read them to Phil in just a moment. So because of the pandemic, we have not had a uh, con international conference in about four years. It is now January 2023. In a few months, in May, we will be having our 13th annual, 13th, uh, not annual, but 13th conference in Japan. It is hosted by several Japanese carnivorous plant societies, and you can learn more by going to carnivorousplants.org slash about slash conferences, or you can go to uh, directly to the Japanese link. We're going to be a couple hours south of Tokyo. We're going to be near Himeji Castle. All of the activities are near there. The dates are May 26th through May 31st. 
So there's going to be a couple of days of uh, presentations. Those are going to be dubbed in Japanese and in English. So uh, you can understand them. And then the last couple of days are some add-ons regarding field trips. Here are some beautiful pictures of the conference venue, the botanical gardens that we're going to be visiting, some of the plant species that they have. Um, of course, we're excited to see the native Japanese plants as well as some other plants that they're cultivating. Here's a pingricula species that we may or may not be able to see in bloom um, the last day of the conference. The most important thing to write down if you're interested in attending is March 31st. That is when you need to register for the conference. It's when you need to register if you're going to present at the conference, and it's when you need to sign up for those uh, field trips. And just like Phil was talking about, you can help the ICPS. The biggest way you can help them, for us, is by becoming a member. And when you become a member, you get access to the last 40 or 50 years of the Carnivorous Plant Newsletter, in addition to getting four brand new newsletters a year. And then you get to interact with our uh, webinar and our guest speakers. Lots of uh, great value there. And if you know teachers or if you have kids in mind, you can go to our education tab. We have crossword puzzles, word searches, coloring sheets. We also have infographics that you can print for your classroom or around your house. This past year, we uh, published five different animated videos about growing carnivorous plants, uh, propagating them, growing them inside, growing them outside. What is a carnivorous plant? We encourage you to share this with your friends and colleagues. If you go to our official ICPS website, icps.clubexpress.com, that means you're a member, you have to log in, but you'll see all of the upcoming webinars that we have. And we also are doing monthly happy hours where you can bring a plant and a drink to your computer and you can talk to people from all over the world about what plants they're growing. Uh, the first Wednesday of May is World Carnivorous Plant Day. This year, which is 2023, it's going to be Wednesday, May 3rd. And on that day, we publish over 24 videos on Facebook and our YouTube channel. And it's from growers and cultivators and nursery people from all over the world. And it's a great way to learn a lot more. And part of that, we also have our annual photo contest. The photo contest for this year is due April 14th, 2023. You do not need to be an ICPS member to enter. Phil, I hope you enter this year. Everyone is allowed to submit five photos. And the top three winners, we have three different categories, the winners receive a one-year membership to ICPS. And this year's judges are the three winners of last year. So we're excited to have them on board. If you go to the about section at the bottom, you'll see there's the World's Carnivorous Plant Day link. And that's where you can submit your ideas for presentations. If you wanna present, that's great. But if you just have an idea, if you have a topic that you want us to get a speaker to present on, that's also great. Another way to help ICPS is by going through our little uh, link. And we have t-shirts and totes and mugs and, uh, Lots of cool merchandise. And something that we started a couple of years ago is every August, from August 1st to August 31st, we're doing Carnivores in the Classroom grant. The past two years, we've been able to give almost 50 grants, $150 each, to teachers all over the world. And this is for them to add carnivorous plants to their classrooms. If you know people in Asia and African countries and South American countries, please, that are teachers in K through 12, it could be a private school or a public school, please let them know because we want to encourage people to grow carnivorous plants all over the world. And like I mentioned, World Carnivorous Plant this year, Plant Day is Wednesday, the 3rd of May. 
If you want to participate with the carnivores in the classroom, you can go to carnivoresplants.org slash donate and you can direct your funds to that program. And another thing is if you go to our social media, Instagram or Facebook, you can see our events. You can see details about the uh, Japanese conference and you can get lots of great information there. All right, thank you everyone for sticking with me for that. <laughs> All right, so Phil, your, um, your microphone's on, so you're good to go. We have okay. a couple of questions. One yeah. is from Philip. Yeah. Are yeah. the plants that outcompete Saracenia mostly native or invasive? And if native, how do you balance justify the removal of natives to preserve Saracenia? Yeah, hi, Phil. Well, uh, the uh, competitors are native species. And so uh, removal probably isn't the right word. We're controlling. Uh, we're controlling with fire and mechanical. So, so think about your question. You've got pitcher plants are poor competitors. And if you don't have a maintenance mechanism like fire or mechanical, then you're going to have a native species like the classic would be red maple, quickly overwhelm and shade out your rare species. So. Uh, that's what's going on there it, because remember pitcher plant habitats are dynamic they're early successional habitats and by nature by their very nature require disturbance control of woody competitors to stay open so but anyway they're native and we justify them based on those reasons it's not necessarily removal it's control knocking them back to to smaller individuals. In some cases, we might remove them depending on the situation. Um, and then Jay's got a question. Yes, he says, great story. Uh, he would Here's love to join you and visit you someday, but he has a meeting right now. He's got a, okay. At least that's says, happy new year to all. Got a question here. So fire grass. Um, so the grasses we have, Susan, uh, we don't have uh, wire grass, which is the main grass fire prone grass and long life pine ecosystems is not naturally found in Virginia. We have what's called broom sedge or andropogon, and that, that is our fire grass. So uh, that grows naturally on the property uh, and quite extensively. And our pitcher plants, uh, flava blooms about the first week in May, followed by purpurea in the second week with some overlap between the two. All right, we do have a couple of other questions. Well, Does the Meadowview officers, can they work remotely or do they need to relocate? Like you were mentioning uh, your hiring. Uh, the, uh, it depends, really. Uh, the secretary, for example, could easily be a remote uh, person. Uh, the VP, probably not. The VP is basically going to be my successor. So we are looking, you know, hey, folks, you know, I can't, I'm not going to last. This is a good forum for it. So, you know, if there's some young person out there that wants to get in, you got to be passionate. But you're going to be uh, the vice president's going to be under my wing, and it's a full-time job immersion, uh, being trained to take over. So it it depends. It could be though. Yeah. Do you see a role that private collections or growers? Can they contribute to reintroduction with rare biological material or not so much? Not so much. And, and you know, that probably hurts to hear. Okay. And, and, and it's, a, it's a very good question because, it, you know, I, I started out as a private collector and I had this goal. And I certainly I want to say, I'm, I'm going to just say I'm a rare exception and I'll explain it though. But so I had the mission here, I found the plants, and for, for a period, not for eternity, I had the plants in ex-situ conservation before they went back to the wild. So that shouldn't be a permanent thing. If theoretically, it could happen, but there's a lot of potential problems. Uh, so, and I think most collectors in their heart know this. So they're growing Utricularia levita, Drosera capensis. And the next thing you know, we've got one of those out in the wild because you missed it or you're sloppy and they got cross-contaminated and it's not what, so, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Not to say, I won't say it can't happen, okay? Because uh, it could, 
but it, it's unlikely to happen. And, and it's frustrating because the, you know, people, somebody like that wants to be involved. I don't want them to be frustrated. So they have, I would say maybe a better avenue is to volunteer with existing org. And there's enough existing organizations doing legitimate frontline conservation work. And, and I would say get involved at that level and work with them at their facilities is what I would say. All right, excellent. Barry Rice wholeheartedly agrees with you. <laughs> Thanks, I, because I asked him that same question about a year ago. Yeah, so, well, you know, people want to help. And I, I don't, I don't want to douse that spirit and it shouldn't be. They want to help and they're sincere. And so we need to give them ways to help. Yes. And by you saying you can volunteer, you can donate with any of those organizations, that's a great and, outlet. And plant. You know, part of the joy, it's got the joy of planning to get out there and stick it in the ground and come back and say, look what I did. I mean, that's like planting a tree. It's a cool thing. So, you know, they're, they're, and those, that's seasonal for us, but they're, they're, for example, Steve Gallick's coming out in March and he's going to help uh, plant pitcher plants on Joseph Pines. So we've got propagation beds at Joseph Pines where plants need to be divided to be planted on Joseph Pines. So maybe there's some other people that want to come out too, you know, so that, that could happen. That's, that's a great way to get involved. Speaking of cultivation, can you talk about growing carnivorous plants in peat versus sphagnum moss regarding the sustainability aspect? It's a very good question. So, um, so here's what I've done, right? So, so let me just tell you what I've done and here's what we're doing. So, so for my life, I've used peat, you know, uh, Canadian sphagnum peat to grow the plants. Now I use, uh, I've done that. I've raised the plants in 100% silica. You can raise them in, in inorganic media, 100% silica sand set in water. I mean, they grow in sand bogs. You don't need to use peat, period. But uh, what we use in our pots at Metaview, we use a mix because there's some positive attributes to organic matter to Canadian sphagnum peat. So our typical mixture has been 50-50, 50% Canadian sphagnum peat and 50% uh, uh, washed white silica sand. Now, we have to acknowledge that bogs are being exploited and damaged. Uh, but, you know, is it by hobbyists growing pitcher plants? Hardly. But it's a, it's a problem. It, it's, it's an acknowledged problem. Um, what we're finding at Metaview, for example, we're generating peat. Our pots, I've got some pots with cranberries that have a foot of sphagnum moss on top. So, you know, we, we, we haven't done this in practice because it, it's just more work, but we could, and we're actually growing sphagnum on our preserves that we could harvest and we could pot in that. But sphagnum by itself is too light, the pots fall over. So we need a mix, we need a mixture. And for the foreseeable future, I'll probably continue to, to use a non-renewable in, in our lifetime media, but we all should be conscious of it that we're exploiting a natural resource. And it's a good question. Do you know where you get the silica sand from or the brand? Uh, it's locally mined. Uh, we've got a quarry here in Gloucester, locally mined in Virginia. But you could go to Lowe's and look at white, you know, get a bag of what washed white silica sand. Uh, I don't have a brand, no. Do you ever test it for total, total dissolved solids or anything? I haven't, I'm lazy. Uh, it's, but you just it's, know it's good sand. For I you. do know it's good sand because the, the quarry that I have, it, they, it's mined locally. They've got it out in the open. It's getting rained on. Yeah, right. You could get beach sand and you have a disaster. Uh, but, you know, for a hobbyist, it's probably something you should look at. Right. Okay. I see we have another he question. Says, a great way for hobbyists to help is to sell their plants and donate a percentage of their money to the cause. It's a great way to support causes with the plants. That's right. Thank you, Steve. That works. James said, should Saracenia growers in regions where they naturally occur be concerned with their plants uh, hybridizing or cross-pollinating with wild specimens? Absolutely. Uh, if, you, if, you're, if you live where pitcher plants are growing naturally, you shouldn't be raising other pitcher plants, period. That, that, that's a no-brainer. Uh, you're going to contaminate them. And actually, we had one grower here in Virginia who moved in next to one of our uh, native sites, and it's now contaminated. It's got leucos and uh, leuco perps. 
So it actually already, it's already happened. That's why it's a write-off. So, um, I mean, I don't know if there's, there aren't many examples of that happening, but it could, and you shouldn't do it. I mean, get rid of your collection. If, you know, if you want to live in, in, in heaven, in pitcher plant heaven, like my friend Bill Scholl, he moved to Apalachicola National Forest. He lives right in the middle of Apalachicola. So he didn't bring his collection with him because he's in pitcher plant nirvana. You know, get rid of it. And since everybody who is attending it live is an ICPS member, they saw Bill's uh, article maybe in the past year about his yes. forked. That's trait. right. Yep, that's right. Yeah. All right, we have two more questions, Phil. How okay. important are private property owners in regards to Saracenia conservation? And I ask that because we had a presenter on a couple months ago in Texas. And they said that 95% of Saracenia populations are currently on private land. Mm -hmm. And I, so yeah. I was just wondering in your area or generally speaking, how do you, what role do you see private property owners in their it's conservation it's of Saracenia? That's a good question. And, and that, that same thing could be flipped around with longleaf pine. Most, most longleafs on private land as well, even old growth. Um, well, those people have a responsibility, don't they? So, but that's up to them. We, you know, they, they're, they're, they're their own masters. They have a duty and they should be told to, to manage and protect these plants. Ideally, what they should do is put the land under a conservation easement with stipulated management guidelines to protect the plants. Otherwise, they're part of the problem, right? Because if they're going to do nothing, and we've seen plenty of this, it's my land. I want to build a house on that pitcher plant. Well, I get them. That's our system. They have a right to do that. But uh, there are a lot of people that, that take a lot of pride in having pitcher plants on their land, but it doesn't guarantee protection. Get an easement. Put the land under easement. Otherwise, you're sp they're spinning their wheels, and it's not going to last. And they, they have to manage. That's the other thing. They might have them now, but uh, a lot of private landowners, you know, you run into this, oh, I'm afraid to burn. Well, you know, you're going to lose the plants. Ultimately, it's going to get shaded out. So they have, they need help and they need education. And, you know, you can, you don't need to offend them, but they certainly have, a, they, they can and should have a role to play. In Virginia, you know, there's just, there's not enough left. And they, people don't care. Then you run into it with people that have them and get off my land. It's my land. I can do with it what I want to do with it. And that's their right. And so a lot of people just don't care. And there's nothing you can do about that. Other, you know, I mean, you got to walk away. And I've had to do that. Education can make them care. It might help. I mean, ultimately, you know, it's, is it in their interest? Who knows, right? But you got to start somewhere and you can't throw in the towel. We got to do something, right? Yeah. All right. The last question is, what would you say is the minimum acreage that you believe that would be beneficial for Saracenia conservation? So if a private landowner owns one acre and they have, you know, 10 plants, 50 plants. Is that anything or, you know? That's a very good question. And the issue, you know, in, in ecology or in uh, restoration ecology, bigger is always better. Okay. There, no, no one is going to, uh, that, that, that's a rule of thumb and it's true. The, the larger the preserved size, the better the ecological function. However, there's reality. We don't always have a thousand or two thousand acres. We and it, this is very true with pitcher plant habitats. We might have an acre. We might have five acres. Personally, I'm not the guy that says, "Oh, that's not big enough. Let's walk away." Well, you know, we're going to lose. We're going to lose ninety percent of things if, with that attitude. And in, I've seen many cases where pitch, small pitcher plant bogs in a little spring can be one or two acres and persist for long, long periods of time. So it really depends on the uh, population and its underlying uh, habitat and ongoing management of the site. So it really depends. But I would say, go for it. Because they're easy enough. If you keep them open, you're going to keep them alive versus death. And then you have a, maybe you have a postcard in the middle of a city. Oh, that works fine. At least you have it. All right. We got an extra question in there for you, Phil. Yep. 
it's from Philip. Can remote sensing be used for discovery of populations? Is this already being done? I uh, presume he means populations of pitcher plants. Uh, could it be used for populations of pitcher plants range wide? Yes. In Virginia, no. The populations are so small, discreet, and in the woods, no. Uh, I know that there have been a number of the guys, uh, they call it drone blogging. Uh, they've been going, sending drones up. Uh, I've talked to actually Steve about this. Uh, and you know, they've looked at the maps, identified good sites, and then I'll consider a drone as a remote sensing. Uh, so drones have been used and is, it is being done to find pitcher plant populations. Uh, in terms of remote sensing, like a satellite, could you see a signature of a bog? Maybe, uh, and maybe it'll have pitcher plants. But in a lot of cases, a lot of this is already known and mapped out by our state heritage program. So it, it could, is answer the answer, could. All right, thank you, Dr. Phil Sheridan, for sharing your passion and the Meadowview Biological Research Station. Thank you for all of those ICPS members who attended it live. And everyone <laughs> else, have a good day. Okay, thanks, Kenny. See you later. Thank you. The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite, but our plants do.